Uh, we're still on the black and white kick. For a while, anyway. Well, welcome back to uh, 42nd Street Pete's Grindhouse, and the weather has changed a bit today, so uh, I'm keeping warm. And uh, someone asked me if I got the results back for those medical tests I had to take. Well, I got, don't, to me, the most important one back is that I got a CAT scan in my head. I don't have a fucking aneurysm, which is wonderful because I already have one near my heart, so. But, you know, that is what it is. Uh, I just had these fucking visions of doing a fucking uh, header walking the dog or something because my brain exploded, which isn't fun. Right? You want my brain explode when I walk you? But, no, I'm doing something. Can I, can I, can I finish the show where you need something? This is what you got to deal with with pets. But, anyway, I got to do this. So, anyhow, that's the story. So, thanks for asking. Um... Should be all right, just waiting for some other stuff to come back. But now someone had asked me about, you know, going on with our black and white stuff, about um, what were my favorite uh, Lon Chaney Jr. performances. And pretty much all of them. When you, think, you know, can you honestly say that Lon Chaney Jr. ever gave a bad performance? Um, a couple times he did phone it in, but, you know, the whole thing was, when he did Lenny in uh, Of Mice and Men, he was sort of typecast a little bit. And when he did The Wolfman, of course, now he's a monster. But the thing is, you know, going back to the black and white stuff, I'll, we'll go with, with two. The Indestructible Man and The Black Sleep, both in 1956. Now, these were both on Chiller Theater on, you know, PIX in New York back in the day. They, they were staples. They were always shown. And... The Black Sleep, no, let's go with Instructable Man first. That was the one where he was Charles Butcher Benton, who just did a robbery and was going to be executed in the electric chair, and his lawyer wanted to know where the money was, but his lawyer actually set him up with his two accomplices. So he vows that he's going to come back and kill them. Well, the thing was that Cheney had talked to the Jack, uh, director Jack Polinex, I believe his name was, and said basically, and I have heard this before from other interviews and people, that get what you can out of me before noon because that's when he started drinking heavily. So basically he didn't want any dialogue or any changes after, you know, the noon hour. So they didn't use any dialogue at all. What they did was he only had a speaking part in the beginning when he threatened a lawyer and then he's executed and then the body is stolen and brought to resident... Um, Mad scientist at the time, Robert Shane, and his assistant, uh, Joe Flynn, who wound up in McHale's Navy, and they bring him back to life by, you know, with electrocution. But the whole thing was, the premise was they fried his vocal cords, but they also made him indestructible, the needle bent when they tried to do this. So, of course, he's going back to kill, you know, the three people that fucked him and get his girlfriend. So it's, it's narrated in a dragnet-type style with the cop, da, 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 you know, going after him. Uh, his accomplices were Joe Marcello and Squeamy Ellis, who he kills. Um, one of them tries to shoot him. Uh, the other thing is, with Cheney not talking, you have to remember that his grandparents were deaf-mutes. So he had to learn, you know, when, he, when he's trying to communicate with the girl, you know, uh, whatever her name was, Marion Carr, I believe it was, the stripper, He's trying to communicate, and it shows through that, you know, he used to have, probably have to communicate with his grandparents like that. So, in this case, he wasn't just phoning it in. Of course, he's captured in a... They're, they're in the sewers of Los Angeles where he has the money, and they basically shoot him with a bazooka and set him on fire, and then he climbs up to this uh, high-tension high line where he's, he's zapped, and that's it. Um, the Black Sleep, the same year, were basically... It was a who's who of, I hate to say it, horror has maybe, but Basil Rathbone is Dr. Cadman, and it was also released as Dr. Cadman's Secret. And what he's trying to do is, his wife is in some kind of a coma, and he has to do brain surgery to fix her, but he has to practice on a whole bunch of people too. So he gets these people by using something called the Black Sleep, supp supplied by Udo the Gypsy, played by Akim Cherimov. Originally, it was supposed to be Peter Lorre, but Lorre wanted too much money and they couldn't do it. So this one guy is taken back, a scientist who was, who was set up for the murder of a guy named Curry. 
and he's taken to the doctor and waking up and said, this is what I'm doing, and they, they do some pretty graphic fucking brain surgery for the time that they show it, and it's like all of uh, Dr. Cadman's misfits are put in the fucking basement. And one of them's John Carradine, who's now a religious fanatic who thinks he's at the Crusades. The aforementioned Mr. Curry, who's Tor Johnson. Um, a couple other people you don't know that are freaky looking. One woman with all tufts of hair over her and the guy they just experimented on whose face just fucking sunk. And Lon Chaney is Mungo, who's another uh, victim of the brain surgery thing, who keeps trying to strangle his daughter. So he's playing, you know, the psychopathic brute. Um, he actually gets strangled by the whole crew when they break out and go after Dr. Cademan. Uh, weirdly enough, this whole thing would be done next year in 1957 with the Unearthly, with John Carradine as the mad, resident mad scientist, who's doing bargain basement um, glandular experiments and putting his failures into the basement again. Um, but going back to Lon, you know, I was, I was looking at the whole IMDB thing, and it doesn't look like he ever lacked for work. Um, in the 60s, uh, producer A.C. Lyles used him in a whole slew of westerns that he was doing for Paramount, like Young Fury, where he was Ace the Bartender, and that's a real insane film because it's basically juvenile delinquency out west. And the bad guy in that film's uh, John Agar. And <laughs> I'll tell you, for a 60s western, it's pretty fucking bloody. And you know, then he was in, um, you know, Hillbillies in the Haunted House, again with Basil Rathbone and John Carradine. Uh, Corman's The Haunted Palace. Um, another really weird movie, Welcome to Hard Times, uh, the Burt Kennedy Western, where basically he, he's a bartender and... Um, He's in with Elijah Cook, who's an undertaker, and a bunch of other people, and they all get killed off in the first half of the movie by the psycho outlaw, the man from Bodie. So, he was in a bunch of things, and, you know, I, I guess it was to the point where, you know, David Hugh had had him in that the gallery of horrors things and stuff like that. I, I You know, and, and it's weird, too, because, you know, sadly, a lot of my favorite actors, like Lon, Lee Van Cleef, Lee Marvin, uh, Richard Boone, we're all really bad alcoholics and really never lived long enough to collect Social Security. And in Cheney's case, you know, he was a heavy-duty smoker and, you know, he had throat cancer and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it was rough, but the guy always wanted to work. And I found that out, you know, talking to people who work with some of these guys. And Aldo Ray was another one. Even though they would get fucked up, you know, before or after work or something like that, when the camera was on, they snapped right out of it. When they had to show up for work, they snapped right out of it. And, you know, it, it was just sad because Lon really felt he was overshadowed by his dad. And, you know, like I said, but, you know, he was never, you know, no matter what he was doing, whether it was a grade B horror movie or an A-Western a, a like um, High Noon, which he was in, and he was in a lot of A-pictures. A um, couple Abbott and Costello films, of course, you know, Here Come the Coeds, he, he was... Uh, a hood, and uh, I guess there was a wrestling thing going on, and he basically wrestled Lou Costello, and the thing was, Lon was a big, tough guy, and he liked to fight. And there's, you know, stories about him and Broderick Crawf Crawford fucking around wrecking dressing rooms and stuff like that. And then, and having Costello meet Frankenstein, and this story's been told so many times, I may be repeating it, but maybe there's some of you that don't know it. Um, Glenn Strange, who played the Frankenstein monster, broke his ankle tripping over a cable in costume. So, the scene where the monster throws the nurse out the window, that's Lon. He s stood up, went back in, became the Frankenstein monster for that one scene so they could do that one. So, everything I've ever heard about Lon was he, he was a sweetheart of a guy, a really nice man, but just really felt overshadowed by his dad. It was a shame. And, you know, like, alcohol, alcoholism is a miserable fucking disease to have. And, yeah, it is a disease. You get addicted to it. And, you know, I may have come close myself, but I, you know, I, I drank a shitload of fucking liquor back in the day, but I was never where I woke up where I thought I needed a drink or something like that. To me, it was just something that came with the territory, and I had my fucking problems with it, me, me being a fucking big mouth and shit getting my ass kicked. So that was, you know, it was my decision to quit. I'd rather smoke pot like I just did before I came in here. So, um, well... That's our two black and white classics uh, for today. Black Sleep and The Indestructible Man. All bear worth checking out. And uh, 
I think the Indestructible Man is still public domain. It's probably floating around somewhere on YouTube or Tubi or something like that. Black Sleep, it's on a Blu-ray now. It looks fucking great, so check him out. So that's our show for today. So until next time, stay safe. We'll catch you on the flip side.